bamboo sticks and all that, tripping over, banging into people, hitting other people, trying to get to, to, the, to the kite. It was a very riotous, but I mean, you know, it was uh, the way life was lived. Yeah. And, and uh, it didn't stop there. We explored the whole of the area to climb Mount Faber. <clears throat> Not by the authorized route, but by the unauthorized route, going into people's gardens and climbing over fences. And so I mean, there was no fun if you went by the road, right? <laughs> I mean, you see, why am I bringing up all this? I want to underline how different the Singapore we live in now. Where children of that age come out, go into the Mercedes, go to school, come back in the Mercedes, pick up their uh, tap, 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 and uh, that's all they see of life. I mean, they don't really see very much else. Okay, some of the others may read a book or two, maybe. But, but other than that, they, 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 uh, uh, and if their parents bring them to somebody else's house, they meet uh, so, some uh, other kids and they say, ah, what game you got? <laughs> I mean, that's about the extent of it. But that wasn't what we lived in. It was, it was quite different. <clears throat> and school has changed. In my day, corporal punishment was not forbidden. It was very liberally used. I mean, we got whacked on the hands, we got whacked on the, you know, uh, parts of the anatomy that the men talking about, I suppose. <laughs> <coughs> this Singapore of 1955 was the watershed, awash with bursting egos and election fever. Marshal Juma Boy, C.C. Tan, Malawi, and almost unnoticed, but okay, why? <laughs> Shouting freedom for all, promising free open air cowboy films, heaven and no more worries. You know, I know. You, you all don't recognize the line either. <laughs> <laughs> that was what we used to shout when we, said, we watched the cowboy films. And if the hero didn't come, then nothing good could happen. Right? So, Blaring pamphlets and loudspeakers, clap as hard as you can. This is your first step away from colonial outpost, dirty harbor city, conquered city, occupied city. This is the end of Janet and John and the SIT. Listen to strong friend associations, striking school Chinese students. Friend associations are just back in the world, I see. Tony Tan says that they're very important. <clears throat> and far from the old end, R.I. Beckham. So that was that period. It was 1959, and a whole new world began. Merdeka. The old order had to go. There was revolution in the air. For me, too, it was a major change out of the gangster land of Havelock Road into the civilization <coughs> of Rathus. The calm teachers, the unavoidable houses and sports. Okay. When the men in white won, there was fear. Down with the white collar, symbol of repression and corruption. <coughs> Up with the blue, perch the civil non-servants chase the bad policemen. You don't recognize the PAP, do you? <laughs> A lot has changed, right? <clears throat> there was the rise and fall of Ong Eng Guan, the mayor. The battle for merger. The merger and confrontasi. Now all these are key words in Singapore history. A mayor sat in city hall and decreed, but not for long, the knives were out. And the men in red who had agreed to wear camouflage white, grenaged, and all but one followed an old doctor across the floor, shouting, Clarissa. 
difficult years when victory was never sure, leading to the battle for merger. The Tunku was firm in 1963, and many regiments occupied Singapore barracks. LKY's fine Malay did not lead to a Malaysian Malaysia, even though they even won a seat. But race riots in 1964 and fears of annexation made the heart a race. So we were booted out to a tearful Singapore in Singapore. All races equal in a national identity, singing Majula to a multiracial, multicultural paradise. <coughs> I think most of us were around then, right? Mm -hmm. Some were not born. <laughs> <laughs> Some were not born. Some were not born. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, I, I uh, am coming to the point where the, I, have, I haven't completed this poem, so it's going to be a bit... Uh, I had said, due to time constraints, I will fight off race. <laughs> but times are hard, decisions tough. Step up those not swayed by sentiment, who were prepared to sacrifice, the echoes of words resonate. Survival when it becomes all accepts, the need for adjustments. But can vote what? For constituency MP what? For parliament got schools? But HTV got job one. So don't complain. You don't want to lose all huh? and spend your days in Changi. Huh? Like those from Cold Stone. Especially now that prosperity comes and trickle down becomes a flood. The university is pumping out graduates. Stability has no price. Become the regional HQ. Build, build, build. Don't worry about neighbors. They are losing ground. But just in case must protect, NS will do the job. Instill discipline, we are primed to win. But never lose control. So create the scholar whose rice bowl will always be full. Kick him upstairs to stand guard. BG by 30 watt. <laughs> PS also can. Minister even. What to complain about? All bonus, bonus, bonus. <laughs> and ISD always vigilant, nipping in the butt. The newspaper owners and bankers agree, must have OB markers. South Center better than repression. And Taukes will always contribute to community centers. Survival. <laughs> The buildings grew taller, everything changes. <clears throat> the dragon in the north is waking, must be prepared. One language for the Chinese. The minorities won't mind. Give them their own boxes and options to be co-opted, but keep the percentages. I had left by then, gone to live in a fledgling Islamic military dictatorship, which was the most free I had ever been. <coughs> so I only saw from afar the death of Chinese education, mm -hmm. the diminution of language skills, the flood of immigrant labor, <laughs> the explosion of HPV, the building of the MRT, mm -hmm. Filipino armas, public school kindergartens, queuing overnight for primary places, the encapsulation of life in three letters, HTB, EDB, COE, MRT, GST, etc. The supremacy of the dollar over ours. All values change, giving place to meritocracy. Pay must equal the best private sector one. Otherwise, government cannot get the best. So it all comes down to dollars and cents. So bring in foreign talents. Seven million also can. <laughs> <laughs> Better than third rate complainers. Buses, trains, crowded out. 
everybody has a car in them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's why I've got up to I mean, let me apologize first for walking in a bit late. One, we couldn't find the room. But two, I've actually just come from a pre-budget forum in which the um, many things took place, among which uh, discussion of a 6.9 uh, tsunami coming on our way, plus a public declaration that the government is incompetent. <laughs> so it was quite an interesting forum. So from there, we're coming here. And we're very happy to see so many people. And children, welcome. Wonderful job. So I think the best thing to do now is to invite questions, interactions, uh, reflections, engagements with children, the poet. Yeah. Can I start? Uh, Morris, yeah. yeah. Um, you can sit down. Yeah, uh, I, I must say, I, I don't know whether Chandran has been introduced as uh, the founder of uh, uh, Society of Singapore, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. Have you been? Have you been? Uh, okay. Not yet. Casey, come in front. <coughs> So now, I'll fast forward uh, two, two most important things now here. One is um, the changing role of, uh, of the writer, you know. The writer always has a role, positive, negative, uh, wind, fish, what have you. But the changing role. And the other one is um, the changing role of um, what writing should uh, the process. Uh, I have since uh, uh, become uh, the president of the Society of Singapore Writers for the last uh, four years. Now, what we are trying to do is this. Uh, we have uh, collective writing, which means uh, we are writing a book now, and uh, we come together uh, to write collectively, in the sense that the writing is done in a meeting, you know. Uh, five or six uh, pieces out of uh, ten pieces are selected for that meeting, and then it will go, back, go into the book. Now we are into the, the uh, fifth chapter of the book, yeah. So um, uh, we feel uh, this is very important because uh, Singapore has become very, in a sense, not only in a national sense, uh, in, in the society sense, in the, in, in the individual sense, very uh, inward looking, and uh, this uh, writing process of uh, collective writing, hopefully, right. And uh, the book we are writing about is. Uh, uh, actually, uh, of, uh, a feminist uh, revolution, you know, uh, everything uh, women are being blamed for, lack of uh, babies, lack of this, lack of that. So um, we're, we're moving away from now, Now uh, you know, this is the other part of feminism, you know, after so many years. But that, that is a, a sign. Okay. So one is the role of writers, uh, I hope you, you can comment, you know, over the years. Singapore, and now there's very great need, you know, national identity, you know, the so-called Singapore story is no more, uh, you know what I mean, it, the cosmopolitan story, now what is that story, uh, that's one, then the other two is this inward lookingness, you know, after so many years of so-called nationalism, we have brought, brought about uh, of uh, some form of nihilism, some form of self-destruction, yeah, both of the national collective identity and the individual. Uh, the individual is, is being elected, but in the wrong sense, you know, narcissistic, egoistic. Thank you. Well, actually, uh, I'm, I'm trying to unscramble all the questions that uh, you, yeah. you got there. I, I, I think the question of uh, what is the writer in Singapore today and what is its function is basically your question. What what is a writer today yeah. and what is his function in Singapore? Yeah. That's basically your question. Uh, yeah, yeah. But Still in the light of some of this development, yeah. <clears throat> well, as I said, I mean, you know, I, I uh, get the feeling that in spite of uh, <clears throat> the National Arts Council and the money and everything that's poured into yeah. publishing, writing, and so on, I don't think that the... Uh, the, the, the uh, <coughs> concept of a writer, the writer's views has been taken into account. I think it's it's more what Singapore gets out of promoting the fact that it has writers, that it has writers. <laughs> mm -hmm. Being represented in overseas uh, functions, being able to trot out uh, somebody to attend uh, 
uh, festival here or a festival there. And to have our very own festival to which we can invite people from, I mean, it's on paper. Uh, what sort of impact has that had on the political reality? Nothing, as far as I can see. I mean, <coughs> the only sort of poet in Singapore today who has any possible political <coughs> input would be Edwin Tambu. And his political input is because of connections from 1950s, which have been kept until now, and not because of, uh, he, of his own intrinsic worth as a poet. He's not being consulted as a poet. He's being consulted as someone who's got a very sharp political grip. And, and I don't think that there are any other writers that I know of, at least, who have that sort of input. Okay, you have some other writers who do not agree with many things and who have given their views and will continue to give their views. These writers are important if others listen to them. But I don't think the government is doing that. I don't think it's the business of government to listen to uh, writers. <coughs> the business of government is to govern. The writers can influence people, can bring up uh, issues to the people, and if the people want to follow up on that, then they will be <coughs> doing a job of influencing the population. Otherwise, if as a writer you can't reach your audience, too bad. I mean, you know, that's that's my point of view. But you want me to add uh, just a little bit, <coughs> Chandran. I think I think Morris's question is pertinent in in more ways than one. <coughs> I think when you and I went to school together, right? I mean, up to sec four, literature was compulsory, right? Um, and I think one of the side results of that was that those of us who did literature did not make it easy for those above us because we questioned, we probed, we analyzed and we responded to texts that were multi-level because we were taught to read those texts at many different levels. So I think the net result of that was about 10 years after that, uh, they dropped literature as a compulsory subject, which continues to be the case today. The latest being Karun Konban has dropped literature. <gasps> Karun Konban, the very poem, you know, very yeah, poem and all that. I mean, yeah. They have dropped literature and so, I mean, for me, literature produces a thinking citizenry. Are we ready for a thinking citizenry? Probably not, because a thinking citizenry doesn't make it easy for the authorities. So it questions and it probes and it raises issues. On the other hand, we've also created, very subtly, and I think this is where the efficacy of the Singapore government is supreme, uh, we've created this super elite, the gifted educated people, where they do a lot of literature, including a lot of Singaporean literature. So that the elites actually have some idea of what's going on. So I think now that we all you know, suddenly become global, there is a, a, a chase of the humanities, and therefore a chase for a literary kind of sensibility. So I think the, the future holds good, for people who are of a literary inclination. I mean, the NUS Yale or the Yale NUS set up, he hit up by a man who is a professor of English literature. Quite amazing. And, you know, a lot of money has been pumped into that. So, <coughs> I think there will be a role for writers. But part of the problem is that we have been so, so, everything has been so made into money that unless your poetry and your fiction also becomes money, it's not going to be so effective, at least not for the next five years uh, or so. If, but if after I may, that, if I may just add a rider to yeah. that. But this process is being managed and controlled by bureaucrats. But now we, well, now with social media and everything, and with all kinds of things happening, it's a little bit more problematic. Yeah. Can I, I make uh, yeah. a more interesting just before oh, you yeah, submit sure, again? Sure. Anybody else want to raise an issue or make a comment? Yes, yeah. I was just curious, <coughs> the storyteller sitting on the sidewalks, um, expounding his or whatever, sharing his story with the people around. Um, do you know anything about the nature of the time? Is it about fables, 
Water margin is about a group of people who are outlaws and who fight against established authority. And, and they each one have their own particular character. The Chinese is talking about the Chinese nurse. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Water margin. And he, he recited it in Hokkien. Oh, it can be it's known under two titles. <coughs> Bandits of the Marsh or oh. the Margin, both are the same. Sorry, what of the Marsh? Bandits, Bandits of the Marsh. Bandits. Like, like, like Chinese Robin Hood. Chinese Robin Hood. No more outlaws. No more outlaws. No more outlaws. Even your own father was a writer of notes. Yeah. Yes. So didn't the family background rub off on you and <coughs> what of the Kerala heritage? Well, I mean, you know, my father actually, before he, he first published his his first short story in the National Newspaper at the age of 17, and it was a play. And then for 40 years afterwards almost, he didn't write any literature at all. But he wrote criticism, he was a journalist, and he was very respected as one of the best uh, handlers of the Malayalam language, which is not the And then he had his first heart attack. And uh, he sat down, and in ten years he wrote ten novels. And and the the last of which was serialized in the the most prestigious weekly magazine in Kerala, which had a circulation of more than a million copies every week. And for fifty two issues, his novel was serialized. In like the old days when Dickens was serialized. And, and that was, as far as he was concerned, that was his greatest achievement. He was very happy. And this happened just before he died. He died at the age of 67.